All right. So we usually start with just going around to do introductions because I think you guys probably haven't met each other yet. Um, and then if you want to share anything about your programs, any updates or good things that have happened lately or anything like that, feel free. Um, well, we're sort of um, the tree spotters of the Arnold Arboretum 2.0 that um, for five or five and a half years, the um, Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts, had started a program through um, Lizzie Volkovich, uh, the researcher there at the time, and her grad students, and also Suze Morozak, who was one of the volunteer coordinators in Danish. Anyway, there were a lot of people involved and they put together this wonderful educational program and just really got us enthusiastic about looking at trees. And in addition, they were sort of learning as we went along too. I mean, there were times we'd say, well, Lizzie, what about this? She said, well, you know more than I do kind of thing. So it was yeah. very exciting about that. And you know, for a variety of reasons, which I don't even remember exactly, Harvard pulled back from it, but there was a cohort. I mean, I don't know how many, I think hundreds of people were trained um, over the years. And uh, so we, you know, just asked who would like to try to continue. So there are about 30 or 40 people on our email list. I'd say of that, maybe a third of them are active tree spotters, some actually the same trees we're looking at the Arnold Arboretum. And some are just, you know, looking around their homes and reporting. And what we've done too, I mean, of course, then there was COVID um, and, um, and the Arboretum was hoping the whole time, which was fabulous. But we also started doing some Zoom gatherings. So we did, um, Lizzie came and talked with us and we had other researchers come and we read some books and had book discussions and um so that's what we stand but we feel a little untethered at this point and um so appreciate you know still being so connected to npn and we just feel like we don't quite and i think people would answer any questions we have but we're not sort of having the uh guidance from above as we had before yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm so glad that you guys have decided to continue the program. Yeah, and I'm sorry that it, you know, the leadership has kind of dropped off um, on the Arboretum side. Um, I think, yeah, it's often, it works a lot better with the program if you do have someone who's kind of like been behind the setup, right? Who's like decided these are the priorities for us. We have these questions we're trying to answer. And then there's someone who's like following up with that as well and saying like, let's check in and look at the data and see if we're like making progress. So you feel like you have a goal and, you know, you can check in and see where you're at in that process of trying to meet the goal. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit of, um, in the context of the survey about like what we're planning on trying to do to help, you know, meet those needs that you guys have. Um, but we really are hoping to get into trying to help people that don't have that person, that researcher, or someone who's going to be looking at the data to do that kind of work to help you answer questions and things like that. So yeah, we'll get into more of that later. Great. Thank so thanks you. for sharing yeah, wonderful. that. So I um, am a Pennsylvania master naturalist. And as part of my capstone project, I decided to work with Nature's Notebook to try to get more data from Pennsylvania. There's a huge gap from Pennsylvania. Um, so right now I just have a backyard group. Uh, we're up to 23 people, hooray. And we will have a formal group at a nature reserve uh, that is part of Brandywine Conservancy, but it's here in Western Pennsylvania instead of Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, we're doing a lot of outreach to different groups to just get people to get data in. And so far we have five programs scheduled for the spring at various events and, and, and tabling events uh, to, to try to bring people in. That's awesome. That's a lot of training. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm sure a lot of work too. Are you doing, um, is it virtual trainings or in-person trainings? A little bit of both. I'm actually partnering partnering with the new group up at Powder Mill Nature Reserve. 
Uh, they, are, they are having a training here in town in April, and I'll be speaking at that as well. Um, a lot of uh, sending people to the website and to YouTube and, and just answering questions. I actually started a Google group for our group so that if people have questions, they can put them there. And I try each month to send out a little bit of, okay, here's what you can be looking for this month. Here's, here's what you can be doing during winter when there's nothing to look at in Western Pennsylvania um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, that, and that kind of stuff. Cool. That's great. Yeah, I'm not sure how many people use Google Groups, but they are pretty effective for having kind of like a newsletter almost or, you know, and a way for people to respond to you as well. So you get that two way communication. So that's great. And Elizabeth joined us as well. Do you want to say anything about what you guys are up to? Oh, hey, yeah, sorry, okay. I joined late. That's okay. Um, do -do. Is it going to work? Can we go? Hi. Hello. <laughs> it's a Friday. I'm in between meetings, but I'm so excited to be here. Um, my name is Elizabeth Spinney, and I work for Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation. And we are, um, I was in the um, uh, LPL cohort for last spring. And we're so excited because we are standing up um, our phenology project. Uh, our local phenology project this year, as well as our involvement in an existing campaign, Pesky Plant Trackers. Um, so we've got a lot going on. Um, so I'm just, I'm excited to start getting in the routine and coming to these these regular calls and having questions. And um, so our um, local phenology program is gonna be focused on tracking the phenology for three specific invasive plants. Um, Linosaurus marwai, so honeysuckle, Rhamnus cathartica, so common buckthorn, and Celastris orbiculatus, bittersweet, so a shrub, a tree-ish thing, and a vine. Um, and we're, uh, this will be the first year of the project, um, and we're hoping to get our feet about us and then um, be able to grow it from there. Um, but we are um, in the the throes of site selection and shoring up all of our observers. Um, we are going a slightly different route. So it's a it's an open project. Anybody can participate that's on Nature's Notebook, but we're specifically recruiting um, my, uh, I'm part of a team that monitors um, the phonology of other things. Um, so we're, we're recruiting my colleagues as well as uh, partner organizations where we have sites. Um, so that's uh, really exciting as well. So we'll have like a core group of people and then to help us sort of like accomplish those core, um, core goals and then have it open to anybody else to participate. So that's really exciting. Awesome. Right, I'm done talking. <laughs> do you well? Do you want to say anything about your podcast, which I feel like is so exciting? <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, so as part of going through the local phenology leader certification course through NPN, um, we had finals, and one of those was to create an outreach um, product. And uh, my product was to create a podcast. And we've actually been able to, um, it's very in-house. It's me and one other colleague. We recorded on our computers, um, but we, we say that we like to woo people with the content um, as opposed to the like, I don't know, audio quality and flashy things. Um, and it's focused on phonology, in a broad sense, but also specifically um, invasive plant phenology. Um, and we're using, we're planning to use it as a outreach tool for our um, observers, but also it's uh, trying to keep the, the information presented in a way that it's accessible to anybody that wants to learn about phenology or invasive plants. Um, I'm, I'm so like, I saw the call out in the last newsletter. <laughs> We I'm glad you guys enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. I listened to just a couple snippets of a few of them, and I thought it was great. So, well done. <laughs> if you want to put the link in the chat, feel free in case other people want to check it out, or I can do it. 
Um, I'm also going to put a few other links in the chat before I share my slides. Um, a couple of things that are just like upcoming opportunity type things that I wanted to mention. I'll put those in there. And then um, does anyone have any questions or things that they wanted to cover today before I launch into the, the slides? Okay, we can also, oh yeah, go ahead. I'm sure it's somewhere on the FAQ um, or in the nuggets, but um, I, I've just, I've had this like thing in the back of my head. I'm like, ah, oh, we don't have a calibration species. Um, is that okay? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. Those. So the calibration species, that was like the very first um, few species we added to nature's notebook. And we just yeah. needed to kind of start somewhere. And I don't even remember exactly what the, or, or the origin was of that list, but um, it ended up expanding even further to these like bigger indicator lists. And then since then has like, you know, expanded into our full nature's notebook list. So I think there's still some value in the calibration species, but definitely you don't have to pick one and you don't have to limit yourself to those. Uh, we, we're starting to think more about that whole idea of indicators again this year, because we wanna make sure that we are collecting or encouraging people to collect data on species that will be super useful. And we definitely do that through the campaign. So any campaign species, we know that there's someone who wants to use the data for those species. So those are automatically, you know, those are gonna be super useful, um, but we wanna kind of, make another maybe set of species in some way that will help guide people. So that's kind of like coming probably this year. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then um, I, I assume this is just like something that I could send to y'all in an email, but um, I have a Symphino phase photo guide okay. that I wanted to get like approved. Great, yeah. Um, like get your stamp of approval so that we could use them. Yes, we would love them. Okay. So you can send it to me or whoever. We have a couple other emails, like the photos email or the phenophases email, but just sending them to me is fine too. And I'll get them sent to Ellen Denny, who's the one that approves them. Ellen, thank you. That's yeah. who I couldn't remember specifically. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh -huh. Anything else? All right. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so some of you have already done this course, but I did want to mention we have another round of our um, local phonology leader certification course starting up in a couple weeks. So if you know of anyone who might want to take that, feel free to share this link with them. It's also in the chat. Um, we are going to have um, Lorianne Barnett, who used to be our education coordinator, who's still been facilitating the course for us. She's going to do it for us one more time this spring. Um, and then we actually have a new volunteer coordinator coming on board on Monday, which I'm super excited about. Um, her name is Sam, and we'll be sharing a lot more information about her and having her come to these calls and stuff going forward. Um, but she's going to be the one who's probably going to be taking over on the course going forward. And we're still figuring out what it's going to look like, um, whether we'll be able to offer it in the fall. We kind of want to integrate it a little bit better with our learning.usanpn.org site, which is where the observer certification course sits. But there's a lot of work to do to get it there. So stay tuned on that. But definitely we're doing it the same way this coming spring. So if there's anyone out there you know about that might want to take it, feel free to share the information. Um, there's an application. You also have to fill out a needs assessment. Although if you already have a group in the system, you probably already have one or we can you know, work with you on that. You can just kind of transfer your information in there. Um, but the applications are due next Friday. Also, we have a webinar coming up next Tuesday. So this is our annual webinar on um, how the Nature's Notebook data were used last year. Uh, our director, Teresa Kermans, is going to do this webinar. And um, she's really trying to dig deep on four of the articles that came out last year to figure out if she can, um, what are the species that they use? Like, so you can kind of, you'd be able to know maybe, you know, what, what species and what locations to see if your data were part of the article, because I think that would be really cool to be able to share with everyone. So hopefully she'll be able to at least find that out for a couple of them so she can let you know if um, potentially your data were used in a publication. And I have that registration link in the chat as well. And then we also are launching a new campaign this year called Queerkiss Quest. Um, this is the almost final version of the logo for that campaign. Um, so that campaign is, um, is part of this huge 
project that's funded by NSF that we just got linked into. Um, and it, it has to do with oaks in China as well as in the United States. And they're trying to figure out all sorts of stuff about how oaks interact with each other, how they hybridize with each other, um, how oaks interact with insects and um, fungus and uh, looking into like the galls and then how all that relates to phenology and how phenology can kind of help inform all those relationships. So it's a cool project. It is kind of limited in terms of the species. We have just nine oaks on the list and it doesn't include um, northern red oak or other red oaks, but it does include um, fir oak, white oaks, and some southern live oaks. So you can see the full list in the registration link. We have that on the registration so you can see if you have any species that could potentially be part of that campaign. Um, and so this webinar is in two weeks and that will actually have um, a couple of the researchers from that bigger project there to talk about how the phenology data kind of fits into the bigger project and, and how the data will be used. All right, so um, thank you. I think all of you have filled out the, the survey for last year, I really appreciate that. Um, so we do ask um, every year that our local phenology leaders go in and complete the survey about their programs. Um, and this is really helpful for us to know both what happened last year, you know, what you achieved, how you're progressing towards your goals, um, and then what resources that we have that you use that you found the most useful so we can make sure we continue to keep those resources going. And then also what's missing. So what are the things that you're hoping for going forward? So we had 47 different programs fill out the survey this last year. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, we do have, uh, we had a little bit fewer response um, this year um, from previous years. So. Uh, we'll try to do better about getting the word out and like encouraging people maybe with better incentives next year to um, have more people fill out the survey. But it's great to have this many responses. So thank you very much for that. So um, the first thing I wanted to share is what people said about their long term goals. Um, and I just kind of roughly put these in categories. There are lots of uh, very individual responses to that question about the long term goals. Um, but just kind of lumping them into these bigger categories. Um, I think this is the first time that the education engagement one has come out as the top one. Um, usually the most common response is uh, we're doing this so that we can track um, like climate change impacts on species or how phenology is changing. But that one came in second this year, um, but still both of them were you know pretty common. Um, a lot of people also mentioned they were doing this as an activity for students, either you know with a university class or with um, younger students to engage them in learning about phenology. Some people also mentioned they were just doing this to not just learn about the changes that are happening, but just baseline data about what's happening right now with species. You know, when do the flowers come out on plants, or uh, when are insects emerging, just to kind of get a better understanding. And then we had a few people answer that they are doing this to inform specific management decisions. And then just one person said they were trying to understand the variability in phrenology. So how flexible is it? You know, is it um, early in some years, later in other years for certain phenophases for certain species? And then as far as achievements, I think the most common response was um, just talking about just collecting data. So we were able to collect a lot of data this year. Some people mentioned they collected a lot more data last year than previous years, which is great. Um, just maintaining the data collection over the course of different seasons. Um, and that is a great achievement. Just keeping that going is wonderful. Some people talked about recruiting new participants and lots of observer trainings, um, both virtual and in-person trainings. Other people talked about um, involving students in using data, um, either that they had collected or just accessing the visualization tool and using the data that's already in there. Um, also field trips where students would come to a site um, and then collect phenology data. Um, a couple of people talked about getting buy-in from stakeholders. So just making sure that they had kind of the go ahead to start their program, which is a great achievement too. Another person mentioned um, setting up a schedule for their volunteers to do monitoring, which I know could be tricky sometimes to get that figured out, um, both trying to figure out, you know, how it's going to work um, in terms of the 
the scheduling platform, um, what everyone's going to use, and also figuring out the best way and the frequency and all that. Other people talked about expanding their programs, so adding on new species. Um, others talked about installing signage like kiosks and other trail signs. And then a few people talked about engaging the public and learning about phenology, either through phenology walks or um, doing like tabling events, um, kind of tacking onto other events, sending out a regular newsletter as well. Um, and then leading a phonology book club. That might've been you guys at the Arnold Arboretum. Um, and another person talked about making a story map. Um, and some of you might be familiar with story maps. It's a, a platform through um, ArcGIS, the ESRI organization where you can create pretty cool um, interactive maps that often it's, it looks kind of like a long web page where you have pictures and some text and it's um, kind of linked into some sort of a map so you can zoom in on different areas and highlight other areas. So it's a great idea for especially places that have a, a large area that they're covering to kind of show the complexity of all the different things that are happening. As far as participant engagement, um, we had an average of 34 people that were engaged in programs last year. And the most common response was 20 people. Um, we did have, I think, three different programs that said they engaged 200 people, which was awesome. And then as far as the number of people under 18 engaged, it was an average of nine. Um, and it, were, it wasn't that many, maybe 25% um, or fewer of the local phonology programs said that they worked with um, youth. And as far as the resources that are used most, um, the Viz tool came out as the top one, which is great because we've tried to put in a lot of effort to that tool over the last couple of years to make it um, intuitive and have useful visualizations. Um, I was kind of surprised that the phonology observation portal was also high on there because I know some people have um, been surprised sometimes when we show it to them that they didn't know it was there. Um, it is always linked from the Viz tool as well. So, you know, as you're exploring your data, if you find something that you really want to look further into, you can always click the button that's on the page to export that data. And then you get the spreadsheet right from there with the filters that you've already preset in the Viz tool. Um, but I know sometimes the phonology observation portal isn't super intuitive because you end up getting this big Excel file. Um, so we're also going to have some more um, help videos and things this year to help people understand how to use and interpret the data files. Also the local phonology program dashboard, which you guys might be familiar with already, especially if you've taken the course. Um, but this is you know, separate from the phonology visualizations that we have. It's more about your number of observers, um, how frequently the data are collected um, at the different sites that you have um, and things like that. So that was also a, a top used tool. Um, also, the botany and phenophase primers. Um, we're still working on the phenophase primer. I think it's about a third of the way done, but Ellen Denny um, is going to be getting back to that this year. So we're hoping that that will be maybe completed this year, which would be great. Um, we're also working on right now, the botany primer um, is not available for purchase. We used to have it so you could have it sent to you and pay for the shipping. Um, we're not able to do it through the same place anymore. So we're still working out details of how we're going to have that available this year. Um, and then also our nature's notebook activities and curriculum part of the website was top used. Um, I know that that whole part of the website needs a lot of work. Um, there's so much stuff on there and it's really hard to find what you need sometimes um, from what I've heard. So we are actually um, actively working on a website redesign right now. Um, and we're going to be putting a lot of effort into making that part of the website um, easier to use and easier to find things. Um, we're actually hoping to have a teacher intern this summer who's going to be going through all of the activities that we have and then picking out kind of a core set of things that we think are really suitable um, for different age levels. So we're hoping to have kind of a core curriculum that we can offer. And then we'll still have all the other resources, but they'll be organized a little bit differently. So that's a, a big goal for this year. Um, also the Nature's Notebook how-to videos. Um, so those are also linked in from the observer certification course. Um, but we are hoping to 
redo some of those this year as well, especially once we get the new website up online. Um, a lot of those are based on what the old website looks like. So we'll be um, remaking those as well. And then a number of people said they use the status of spring maps, which is really cool to know about. Um, those are, you know, they're kind of one of our, we call our data products. Um, so it's, a uh, you know, meant to be kind of an indicator of spring activity. And most often we see that the media are really interested in these maps as kind of a way to, to give people an idea of um, how spring is unfolding at their location. Um, you know, it is an indicator of this early season spring activity and especially the anomaly maps that compare how this year is um, looking compared to this 30 year average um, can be a useful way to kind of understand how early or late spring is arriving. So I'm glad that a lot of people are using those. Um, our program planning materials as well, that's like a major part of the uh, local phonology leader certification course, but I'm glad that people are still accessing those as well. The community of practice, which is these calls, as well as the, the forum that we have, um, we have some people using those. And then the observer certification course, the community forum, the Fino forecast and then the host event resources were a little bit lower. The host and event resources is another page that just has a ton of stuff on it. And so we're going to try to organize that a little bit better. The things that are on that page are things like um, flyers that you could use and customize, um, PowerPoint presentations you can use in a workshop, the logos that we have, um, all the things that you might need for doing either a, a training or just a promotional event. So we're going to go through those and make sure that they are um, as good as they can be and kind of organized maybe in a little bit better way um, this year. And then as far as where you need support, um, the top thing that came out was um, analyzing my local phonology programs data to understand patterns and answer questions. Um, and these were um, defined responses, so um, people could check um, one or more of these boxes. But I, I'm glad that this came out as the top one because I have been hearing about this from a lot of different programs. Um, and we, we recognize that, you know, especially for those of you that have been doing this for many years, um, I know you get to the point where you have all this data and you want to do something with the data and know that you're working towards answering the questions you have. And it, it sometimes is hard um, if you don't have a background in data analysis to know where to even begin. And even though we do have our biz tool that has you know, some ways to visualize your data, and even the scatterplot tool does have a way to you know, look at the simple relationships between things like climate variables and the onsets of different phenophases. It's really not enough to get you there, you know, in terms of answering your questions. So this is a major thing that we're hoping to really get into this year. Um, we're going to start next month with um, the local phonology leader call in March is going to really focus on finding out what are the kinds of questions that you guys have where, you know, you have this data and you want to answer some question, but you can't because you're limited you know, by not being able to do it in the Viz tool or not knowing where you would go or what statistical test you would use. And so we want to be able to figure out first, like, what are those categories of things? Is it, you know, you really want to explore the relationship between climate and phonology? Or do you have a question about comparing like two different sites to each other or looking at the differences between species? Or does it more have more to do with how much the phenology of a certain phenophase like flowering is shifting and whether that's really a significant difference. So we're, we're gonna develop a list of those things by having kind of a brainstorm session next month. Um, and we have a, another local phenology leader, Karen Beter is going to join us. She's at the Wells Reserve National Estuarine Research Reserve. And so she's actually been diving into their data recently and um, has learned a lot about both how to interpret the data file and kind of figured out things that were hard for her. Um, so we're gonna work with her and then with the list that we develop next month to come up with a series of video tutorials. And so we're hoping to be able to offer a lot of different short videos on how to like understand the file that you get from the phonology observation portal, um, start to do some um, 
they're called like pivot tables, way to, ways to easily um, transform your data into different metrics. Um, and then to use some online tools for doing some simple tests like a t-test or a regression um, and be able to have a way to do that. So you could do it either in Excel, but also with free programs, because I realized that Excel is not always free. Um, it doesn't come on all computers. So we want to be able to make sure that everyone can do those, those kind of things. So that is our plan. Um, it'll be unfolding over this year, but um, we have lots of ideas there. And we definitely want to support you all in this area. Uh, another couple of things that came up as needs are volunteer engagement and recruitment. Um, and I'm very excited that we're going to have our volunteer coordinator coming on board next week. Um, a lot of what she's going to be doing is in this in this realm of volunteer engagement and recruitment. So um, she's really going to be focusing on developing resources um, and also reaching out to new audiences for us as well. Um, but we'll hear more on that in the coming months. Um, and we did have some people that wanted more connection with other local phonology programs. Um, we are in the new website redesign. Um, a major new feature we're going to have is a map that will have all of the local phonology programs on it. This is something that people have asked about a lot over the last few years is how do I find out who's near me that's doing phonology monitoring and how do I get in touch with them, you know, and either meet up to leverage resources or do trainings together, um, connect in other ways. So we're hoping to have this map be um, on the new website and it'll be a way for you to find out, you know, the contact info or the names of people near you. And it'll also be a way you can get more volunteers as part of your program because we'll be sending new volunteer or new observers to that map and they can see who's near them and potentially like request to join your group um if they're interested so that's one way we're hoping to do that um we also we have that forum that i mentioned which is our basically our listserv moved over into google groups um it's a way for people to ask questions for um advice on different things uh and i realize it's not set up in the best way so we're going to look into how we can make that better um because i think especially if you're going through the forum to try to find an answer it's hard, you have to like go through every single email in there, you know, or look by the subject line. So we're gonna see if there's a better way to maybe tag the different emails in there or some way to categorize the things that are there so that you can look and see if you your question has already been answered by someone else um, or if uh, it hasn't yet, and then you could still use the form to ask the question. Um, and then we had some people need more support in creating an annual report. Uh, we do have a guide on this, which is, I realize, a little buried. So the new website will make that easier to find. But that guide is also several years old. I think it might have been made in 2016. So there's definitely more updating that needs to happen with that. So we'll try to get to that this year as well. Um, accessing and downloading the data is a lower than the analyzing the data. Um, so I think there's still a little bit more work to do with helping people to find their data. So um, it should be that on the new website, it'll be a little bit easier. I know right now, if you want to visualize your programs data, there's like a couple ways you can get into the tool to do that. So making that a little simpler, uh, I think will help a lot. And then program planning, uh, we just had a few people that needed more help with that. So um, again, I think the new website will make it a little bit easier to be able to access those resources. Another thing that I would, love to see on the new website we're still figuring out how this will work technically um so we have you kind of go through a process when you set up a group where you first fill out a needs assessment form and then you do a group request and then we ask you to fill out the annual survey and then we ask you to do an impact statement and then um we welcome you to, you to apply for the pheno champion award and all of that's kind of separate and I would love to see it in a better format so that you could, you know, log in as an administrator and see all of that stuff more easily. So, you know, if you've already submitted the survey and you could pull in your old impact statement and update it and just make that a little bit more user friendly. So still figuring out how that will work on the back end of the website. But that is the goal <laughs> is to make that better because I know it's, it's kind of a hassle right now the way it's set up. 
Um, and then we did ask this year a specific question about how do you feel about your level of engagement with other leaders? And I was kind of surprised that most people said that they're satisfied with the level of engagement that they have. Um, so I think, I mean, well, we're still gonna try to do more here, but I'm glad that the majority of people feel pretty good about this. Oops, sorry, my little um, bullets got messed up. Um, so um, we also, this is my favorite part of the survey is asking for your tips that you have for other leaders so that we can share them. Um, so I kind of grouped these into different categories. Um, the first one was around training for new observers. Um, and one person recommended creating a video for observers to watch. Um, and another person emphasized that in-person trainings are really important. Um, and I, I think that I agree with this, that even, you know, you can have really great training videos and do a lot of great virtual things, but there's nothing that really replaces being outside and doing that training in person with people. So as much as you can incorporate that, I think that's really helpful. Um, and I know a lot of people have gone to kind of a mentoring system where they have experienced observers that will, at least for the first couple of visits, like go out with the new people to make sure that they've, you know, experienced it with someone else and they can answer any questions and actually like physically point out the thing on the, the plant or show the animal. And um, I think that's just like a lot more helpful. Uh, but if you are doing a virtual training, um, one person recommended that using pictures and polling can make it really interactive. Um, and I've been trying to do this on webinars lately too. Um, on Zoom, at least, they have a pretty good poll system set up and they even have a new quiz thing that they have available. I haven't used it because there's some limitation on if not everyone has the updated version of Zoom, you can't see them, but the polls are pretty safe. So I often will have like a picture of a plant and then have the poll be pretty much like part of the nature's notebook data sheet. Like, do you see open flowers? And then yes, no, question mark. And then everyone can kind of practice doing the data sheet um, with the picture. It's not the best doing a picture, but it at least like helps people start to think about um, how to answer the questions. So that can be effective. Uh, for experienced observers, I think even though you might have people that are pretty comfortable and off and running, it's good to still check in with them. And then um, I always like to emphasize this idea of a calibration training. Um, and the person that um, put this tip in mentioned that, especially in different seasons, it can be really important. So maybe you do an in-person training in the spring and you're able to look at breaking leaf buds and maybe open flowers, but then it might be good to do another training in the fall. So you can look at fall leaf color and try practicing the estimation of intensity with people, because that can be kind of tricky too. So just thinking about, you know, how you can space out trainings at different times of the year, so you can um, cover those different phenophases that give people trouble. I think it's a good idea. And another uh, couple tips kind of fell into this like creative ideas for engagement category. Um, so one person, I think this was the pesky plant trackers group. Um, they do a blog about what's happening. I mean, it sounds like Wendy, you're kind of doing that too with your Google group, but kind of giving tips and prompts about what to look for. Like in this month, you might want to focus on this phenophase and make sure you're checking for that and just give people um, something specific. Um, another group talked about making video profiles that don't just cover, you know, how to observe the species in terms of the phenology, but also including fun facts and things, kind of like a profile of what that species and cool things to know about it or um, things that might be interesting that keep people engaged. Another person mentioned that um, they found that in their experience, if they assign students individual trees, that really seemed to help with the students like feeling like they were invested. It was their tree and they had to make sure that they captured the phenophases instead of um, you know having people kind of rotate through um, lots of different individuals. Also, I think. Um, this is always a good idea, if you can, um, to involve any volunteers you have or students early on in the process. Um, you know, and even if you could involve them in selecting species, that's really cool. Um, but if you already kind of have your questions and your species defined, you could at least like ask their advice on, well, where should we set up our site? Um, how big should we make the site? Which plants would make sense to add? Um, so that it's, you know, the, the easiest in terms of accessibility and efficiency of time. Um, and if they have that input early on, I think it really helps them to have more of an ownership over the program and um, it can help them stick with it over the long term. 
And then just trying to leverage other programs. And hopefully the new map that we'll have will help with this, but just connecting with other programs um, to do like combined training, um, do like combined promotion if you can to do recruitment and things like that. And then a couple just like more technical tips. Uh, one person mentioned that if you're in a place, especially I think for people in national parks or other places where you're not really allowed to tag plants, um, they found that Google Maps can be pretty accurate in tagging different locations. And then you can either have the map linked from somewhere, you can send it out in an email or a newsletter, um, or you can print it out you know, and have it available that way. And then um, I think a couple of people were stuck, our head volunteers stuck on the, the old app. So definitely make sure you have the new version we don't support the old app anymore. And I was just talking to someone recently where they had a bunch of data on the old app and it just stopped working totally. They couldn't do anything on it. So definitely follow the prompts to, to download the new one. Um, and then someone brought up safety concerns. So I know um, with some of the invasive species, especially like wild parsnip, you've got to watch out, and make sure you don't touch it um, and just be aware of other things out there as well. Critters that volunteers might want to be aware of when they're out doing their observations. So that is all I have to share from the survey. Um, I would love to hear about your feedback. If you feel like you agree with that stuff, was there anything that stood out or things that are missing um, in terms of either resources you need or anything else, um, feel free to share. Erin. <laughs> Would there be the possibility of an area on the website where uh, local leaders that are creating all these wonderful videos and, and things could share with other leaders so that maybe we can share resources and, and, and help each other, especially, I think, with the phenophases? Yeah, yeah, I love that idea. I would wonder, um, like, what would that look like, do you think, in terms of how you, so if you had, like, 50 videos or resources, like how would you want that organized? Would it be by species or by like region or topic? It's just, you know, it's hard to know like what's the most intuitive way for people to sort through a big list of things like that. I would think topic and then species. Okay. So topic might be things like, uh, like the, how to answer the questions on the data sheet, or would it be more like I don't know, spring phonology. I guess it could be a lot of different things, but. Yeah, I think I, I, I think a lot of things. I mean, if people are, are doing these wonderful videos showing, you know, the different phases and how to identify them and how to estimate and everything. If, 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 if we could share those things, I, I, I just think that would, that would help. Yeah, yeah, maybe even like a tagging system. So, you know, if you if you wanted to um, upload a video, you could say like this includes like spring phenophases and it includes deciduous trees and it includes making observations outside. I don't know. So it's something to help people find it. Right. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I think that would be great. Yeah. I, and I would love to have the ability for more of our especially people who are logged into nature's notebook that have an administrator role i think we would be comfortable with like opening that up so that you guys could upload content you know there's always like security issues and bots and things like that we have to think about but i think the the bottleneck in some ways is like our staff being able to get everything uploaded and know like what's in this thing you know and how do we like categorize it so putting that on you guys, I think would be really helpful, you know, if we could like give you that role. Um, but yeah, I really love that idea. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Or questions or anything? Um, ideas for upcoming calls too, if you have them. I really have loved the um, refresher style um, calls. Those have been really helpful as I'm calling back to the training uh -huh. <laughs> from, from a year ago. Um, and I think moving forward, um, like looking at those recorded calls has been really helpful. Okay. Um, and at, at least for me, like being able to like 
go back and, and you do such a great job when you demonstrate how to use like the visualization tools or uh, nature's notebook. Uh, those are all really, really helpful. Um, and like the, the finer detail kind of topics versus like the general, like here's how to use um, the visualization tool, but like here's how to pull up this specific kind of data, like that's super helpful. Okay, cool. Yeah, that is great. So yeah, I think next month we would try to get into some of those, like what are those specific things that you want us to show in the Viz tool? You know, because we know some of the the broader categories of things, I guess, but knowing like what kind of question would you try to answer? I think that's what we want to get the list of. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully you can come next month and help with that. Um, and also, um, so is the, you mentioned going back to the recordings, is having it in this kind of format where it's like an hour long webinar -y kind of thing useful or would it be better to have like shorter videos where it was just like almost like a tutorial where it was like, okay, now click on the visual link and like go right into it. Would that be used more useful? Potentially. Um... I, I hesitate because I don't want to speak for, for everyone um, that's a, a user of the resource. Um, but yeah, like being like, um, I can look at the description of the video and see like, oh, okay, this was discussed and then know okay. that versus like going through all the like training materials and trying to figure out where that specific information was, was listed. And um, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Like having like short little like, Hey, and today we're gonna do this um, mm -hmm. this specific thing with the tool. Okay, that's pretty. That's that's intriguing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if we had something like that, I think the places where you would find them would be either like the visualization tool landing page. We could have a set of short videos there that was like um, how to make a scatter plot or how to make an activity curve. Um, and it could be more focused than that. It could be like how to look at the interaction between a butterfly and the flower, um, you know, in this one region and have it be a little bit more defined that way. Um, and then the other way or other place I could see putting these is um, when we revamp the website, we'll have like a different resource page for local phonology programs. And I could see having a series of video links there too. And hopefully that would be an easier way to find them than having to, like you said, like hunt through a bunch of the training materials. I think for our group, we had decided when we moved into this 2.0 phase that we really couldn't do trainings at this point for new people. And though, you know, we have informally taken people around who've been curious and I've never explored the NPN site. I mean, if we could, can we direct someone to NPN and they could really sort of learn all there is to know or is it, yeah. Or is it yeah, yeah. So we have been working on the observer certification course. And so that actually has, um, I think it'll end up with either five or six modules in the end, um, hopefully in the next couple months. So the first module is just the general like how do you create an account and set up a site? How do you make an observation? How do you edit your data if you need to edit your data? Um, so the basic basics. The second module is about the app. So how to use the Nature's Notebook app, app specifically. And then the third one is a little bit more in depth on the phenobases for plants. And then the fourth one we're almost done with right now is all about intensity. So estimating intensity. And so I think all of those things would be really useful to have your new observers go through and it'll give them the basics, you know, on, on that stuff, you probably would still probably need to have someone, you know, go out with them and, or join an experience volunteer for the first couple of visits. Um, and then the last module I think is just, um, it's a practice video. So there's a video and then you, um, you answer the questions in the quiz. Um, the videos. So, the videos I was talking about for the data analysis and like understanding the data files, that's something we're going to be working on this year um, and making. Cool. But the like basic 
modules like you were just describing? Oh, yeah, yeah. So we have um, modules one, two, and three on the course right now. So when you log into your observation deck, like up at the top, it says um, the learning content. And it's, uh, it's actually a, an outside website called learning.usanpn.org. That's where the course is hosted. So those three are up as well as the, the practice one, which I think is module seven, because we thought we were going to have seven total and that one got done first. But I think it'll probably end up being five or six in the end. Um, but the module four is the one we're finishing up right now, which is the intensity one. But it should be up in the next couple months. And also, Erin, um, when you said that you're about a third of the way through with the pheno phase, mm -hmm. um, so um, is it possible to see which ones you have, or is yeah. that... Let me put the link. Yeah, we have the partial version up. I think part part one. Let's see. Um, yeah. So you have you seen the botany primer? Oh, okay. So this is the link to the botany primer, which is done. And then phenophase primer is section one, <laughs> is this one here. And those actually, um, they're linked from a lot of different places. It's not super easy to find them. So <laughs> maybe just download the PDFs for now. Um, they are on like the various resources pages that we have on the Nature's Notebook website. But, and they're also linked from the observer certification course. So if you ever lose them, you could find them there. Oh, you're muted. Did you, were you saying something else? Okay. Um, so when do you think you may have all the phenophases done? The primer? Um, I don't know. I'm hoping this year. I It's kind of out of my hands, but um, yeah, I don't know. I'll try to get it. I mean, it was started in uh, June 2017 on here is when it was started, but lots of other things took priority, so. Yeah, um, no, and I think we even started doing one too, but I don't think yeah. that was completed. So I know it's a lot of information, especially to if yeah. there's photos and everything else. So, but it's yeah. great if it's this year. Yeah, I know. So Ellen Denny, she's the one that's like really doing a lot of the content for it. Um, she has been taking photographs where she lives in Maine to like be the photographs and like do every tiny little transition. So you can see like, what's the difference between like a, when the dormant flower buds start swelling and like show you that for a bunch of different species. So she's like very detailed and recording all of that. So we'll have a lot of good content eventually. It just needs to get into this guide. Yeah. No, that'd yeah. Be great. Any other questions or thoughts? Um, Elizabeth asked other time estimates. Yes. Um, Oh, I just looked this up for someone. They are listed at the, the intro slide to each one. I know module one is 45 minutes, two is 20 minutes, three is like up to two hours, three is like the bigger one on the phenophases. And I feel like the last one, which is the practice one, is also 20 minutes. And the intensity one will probably be another longer one. Anything else? So many great questions. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have? Oh, 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 sorry. Oh, I guess I'm I'm still uh, unmuted. Um, and this is also on the NPN website. Is there like resources of just as I said, we've been doing these book groups, and generally we sort of generate our own ideas, and there's certainly plenty of things. But does NPN have a list of books that they feel would be you know great to read and things like that? We don't, I don't think, but that's a good idea. Um, I feel like, have you seen the forum that we have? You know, I, I don't think so. I've just sort of stumbled across this and I'm so glad that I did. Yeah, I so this is, and you should let me know actually what you can see when you go to this page, because I think you might have to join to be able to post, but you might be able to see what's already been said in this forum. And I know if you search in there, 
for books. A couple of people have talked about books they've used, um, but we could certainly, I mean, if it's of interest, we could like compile that list. Um, or like I said, it's just hard to find stuff in here. So maybe we could create a tag that says like book recommendations. And so you could just look in here. Um, the problem with like when we start to put more stuff on the website, you know, like lists of things, it can get outdated and like maybe they're, you know, we should be checking in and updating it once a year. And then it's just like too many things for us to keep track of. So it's better if it's like an externally kind of, um, I don't know, maintained list. But yeah, we'll, we'll think about that. I waited to do that. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So you, can you see the content on that link? You know, I was able to see the content and then it said that I could even join, but I have different emails and I thought, you know, I better line up my emails. So I okay, did, yeah. But I did see a list of conversations. Okay, so. great. Yeah, so you should be able to look for the book recommendations. And then, yeah, if you want to join, um, then you can post things as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Anything else? All right, well, thank you so much for coming and all the great questions and everything. Um, and hopefully you can join us next month and we'll really get into what questions you have about the data. So. Great, great. All right. Thank have you Have a good so weekend. Much. All right, take <laughs> okay, care. Bye. Bye.